So today on Face to Face, we are interviewing Derek Blasberg, who is the head of fashion and beauty at YouTube. He's also a very old friend of mine, so it should be a very interesting chat. Hope you enjoy. It's always been fun for me to watch from an outside point of view, you sort of uh, transform into different... Why do you say an outside point of view? I thought we'd been friends for the past 19 years. <sighs> You're cute, but not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to start off with from the very beginning. When I was a kid, uh, my, my parents still tell the story, I wrote on my bed sheets with a Sharpie marker, New York or bust. How old were you? I was, I don't know, a teenager. <laughs> but I knew even then that I wanted to be where the action was. Right. And, and I'm still looking for where the action is. The year between your junior and senior year of high school, in most families, you do like a college tour. Right. You try and figure out where you want to go after high school. And my parents came to New York, and my mom took me to see Williams College and Amherst and all these sort of Tony New England schools uh, that lived in the, in the woods. And, and we looked at NYU. And when I came here, I, I just realized, oh, this is, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is where the action is. When I was a freshman in college, I worked at Elite Model Management. I wrote all the biographies. My sophomore year, I moved to London, and I was an intern at Dazed and Confused. My junior year, I came back to New York, and I interned at W. My senior year, I interned at Vogue magazine. But when I got to New York, I really wanted to be conscious of the sort of people, the sort of family I was creating. Yeah. But I think a lot of people who come to New York with a clean slate don't necessarily fill their slate with awesome, incredible people. Right. Yeah. And I've been very fortunate that the people I filled my life with were lovely, generous, incredible, successful, um, very often good looking, like you. <laughs> it seems like from, from researching you in depth, mm. you've had lots of breaks. I moved here in 2000. It's 2019. Wow. And I moved here when I was 18. So by the numbers, I have lived in New York now officially longer than I lived in Missouri. Right. So I still identify as a Midwestern boy with an honest moral code. I wouldn't call them a lot of big breaks. Uh, I'd call it a steady burn. <laughs> um, when I was in college, I had all these internships. I worked at Vogue. I worked at W. When I graduated, I had this job at Vogue. Right. I worked there for a year. I was fired, which would be the opposite of a break. <laughs> break up. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think what's interesting about that is that when I was fired from Vogue, it was actually an incredible lesson on how to hustle and have a comeback. Uh, when I didn't get jobs I really wanted, you sort of need to dig deeper and find a renewed sense of vigor. You know, we're living at a time now when magazines are not doing super incredibly, yeah. and I went to journalism school, <laughs> right. and I really thought I was going to work exclusively in magazines for the rest of my career. And now I work at a tech company. There are these moments, I think, in any career when um, you can get knocked down and yeah. stay down, or you can get knocked down and find another way around. When I was an intern at Vogue, and I've said this before, uh, one of the people I worked with introduced me to this professional motto that I don't know is so prevalent today. And it's just the idea of easy to work with, happy to be here. I would show up early, you'd unpack trunks, I would untangle necklaces and earrings and the accessories closet. I was the first person to ask if anybody wanted to get coffee. I'm going out, can I grab you anything? I'd stay late. Yeah. I would go to the uh, showroom appointments. I would take notes. I would take, pull this is gonna age me. I would take Polaroids. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that was the sort of uh, work ethic and ability to, to really overstride, uh, tap into a, a super large well of ambition. Yeah. And I think that's what, what paid off. Can you explain to the audience what at large means? Yeah. At large has become a very broad and vague term, I think, to describe members of an editorial team who are non-traditional office worker bees. Right. Uh, the term has now become very widely used to explain different things, but in my experience, when I was the editor-at-large of a magazine, 
the suggestion was that my skill set doesn't necessarily exist in the office on Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. At large was more of a term to describe someone who was... Floats in and floats out. <laughs> yes. Well, more importantly is the one that's out, uh, you know, oh, who is this new actor? Or this new model is incredible. Or did you know that, you know, so-and-so has a 16-year-old gorgeous girl, we should shoot them. Right. Or here's a new designer I found in Marrakesh. Or right. they're opening a new hotel in Paris that would be incredible for so a So you really get like finger on the pulse of what's going on kind of thing. Excuse me? Finger on the pulse. Um, yes. I did have my finger on the pulse. <laughs> but not by accident. If, if somebody came along to you and said, what, what do you do? Yes. And some people say, I'm a photographer, I'm a stylist. Are you able to say one word? Because it seems like you have a few titles. I would say I'm the head of fashion and beauty for YouTube. Okay. But I also work at an art gallery and I, a contributing editor at Vanity Fair and Architectural Digest. The reasons I went to journalism school when I was 18 years old was that I was interested in creative people, uh, telling stories, collaborating with photographers and stylists. And what I realized a couple of years ago is that the way that we consume fashion and beauty and fashion news is no longer necessarily entirely in magazines or even in the written word. So what I do at YouTube now is similarly what I used to do with magazines and what I wanted to do in college. In a lot of ways, do a lot of the same things that I did at Vogue or at Vanity Fair. It's just a different medium. But what still appeals to me about this job is the same thing that appealed me to those jobs and what appealed to me about moving to New York and working in this industry. So my purview at YouTube is really fashion and beauty. What I'd love to be able to say is that obviously I saw the digital revolution coming from a mile away and that's why I got so involved in Twitter and then Instagram and YouTube. But the answer is no. Okay. I didn't see any of this shit coming. When I was 18 years old, I had never heard the word stylist. Now there are 18 year olds in Missouri where I grew up who can Google what's an art director. Yeah. That's an incredible opportunity. Yeah, yeah. People can go on YouTube and see my beautiful face talking to your <laughs> rather repulsive mug. <laughs> Thank you. And learn all about... Uh, wow, the charm really comes out. <laughs> I can see why you've succeeded. <laughs> and learn all about not only fashion, but photography or art or engineering or gaming is huge on YouTube. Do you, do you still write a lot uh, compared to what you used to? Not, not compared to what I used to. Do you miss it? I, I miss it. I do, yeah. I'm working on a couple of books at all times, and I've had four books come out, and I miss the sort of solitary time when you're focused on a single project, and nowadays when you have so much going on. Yeah. Uh, we were saying earlier, having a finger on the pulse, and that's not by accident. Like, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is look at my Instagram and my emails, and the last thing I do before I go to bed at night is look at YouTube, you new know, videos that we have coming up on fashion and beauty, and I, this is actually really, quite dark. The last thing I do before I go to bed is I go through my entire inbox to make sure every single email from that day has been read, responded, and deleted. That's so you end up with zero every day. Mm. That's crazy. It's crazy or it's efficient. In my 20s, as you know, I was everywhere and I did everything and I was really trying to stretch myself super thin. In my 30s, I hustled and I wrote for anyone. I said no to nothing. I wrote for free magazines. I wrote for European magazines. I wrote for Japanese and Chinese magazines in languages I don't even speak. But I was so determined to make a name for myself and build a portfolio and have a career. And as I think about what my 40s will look like, I hope to have more time for that far-flung exotic travel and that spiritual enlightenment and paying 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds to do all the stuff I did in those decades. I think in my job, in my life, my passion has really been defined by looking where the action is. Right. So when that's on YouTube, you are literally going to where the views are. What are people interested in seeing? If it's at an art gallery, what is the painting everyone is talking about? What's the museum everyone's talking about? What's the model everyone's talking about? So I don't know how you define inspiration. I think everyone defines inspiration in a different way. So do you think then coming from where you came from, from St. Louis, from St. Louis? St. Louis. St. Louis. <laughs> Going from St. Louis. 
Do you think that that drive, like if you had, for example, grown up in New York, do you think you would have had less of a drive because you'd already made it, you'd already grown up here and that was half of the thing for you? I often think that it's my Midwestern sensibility and upbringing and honorability and honesty that has sort of made me an anomaly in this town. Right. Um, especially in this industry. Yeah. Hard work, determination, showing up, uh, punctuality. <laughs> I was an hour late today. Um, <laughs> all those sorts of, uh, you know, good moral code, nice guy. Yeah. Those are the sorts of things that I think set apart um, someone that you want to work with. Being a people person uh -huh. and sort of having this power, this magnetism where people open up to you. Right. And when you're interviewing people. The secret of people opening up to you is being able to keep a secret. Right. That's interesting. Like I know a bunch of shit about you. <laughs> and you're keeping it secret. <laughs> I think anyone who's good at their job has a certain element of psychotherapy or a therapist. Right. And I actually think to what you just said a minute ago, I think everyone loves to uh, talk about themselves and tell secrets and be open and be honest. Yeah. And I think people are very often guarded or scared to do that, but when they find someone they can do that with, it feels great, it feels incredible. Right. Which is interesting in, in an industry where we see people all the time, every day, that people have that need to open up to people, because you'd think that it would happen all the time. But when you all... said that you wanted to work in fashion, did people tell you it was a cutthroat or superficial or scary industry to work in? No. Because everyone told me that. <laughs> <laughs> And I have found that that has not been the case right. for me at all. But maybe it's because of your outlook. Or maybe it's because I've identified people who are not fake, superficial right. monsters. It's and a big I've chosen river. to spend my life with people who I think are honest and yeah. open and incredible and generous. I would probably tell a younger version of myself, it really is slow and steady wins the race. I think when you are young, you think your whole career is made or broken in a story or in a moment or in a party or in a job offer. And if you miss one of those, it's not over. When I turned 30, I did a big party at my house in St. Louis. And what was so incredible is that I had this whole life uh, when I lived in St. Louis, I had all these friends and I moved to New York and I didn't know anyone and I built this whole new family. And that was the first time I got to see both my Missouri crew and my New York crew together, and it was this sort of fabulous, surreal moment. Surreal, I'm sure. Super surreal. Yeah. It was also a country western theme. <laughs> and it was an incredible opportunity to have these two worlds converge, and it sort of, um, it was great for me to see everything, it was great for me to see that everywhere I came from helped contribute to what I was today. Right. And everything that I am today is because of where I came from. Thanks for watching, and if you want to see more face-to-face -face interviews, then you can click here or here or subscribe somewhere around here.